Okay, let's get started with this week's uh, Miami Global Brain Tumor Symposium. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, just quick introductions before we get started. My name is Michael Ivan. I'm one of the neurosurgeons here at the University of Miami and director of our brain tumor research program uh, and a uh, brain tumor and skull-based specialist. And I'm joined by my co-directors, Dr. Morcos, who is a professor and the co-chairman of our department here of neurosurgery, uh, also the director of our cerebrovascular and skull-based program. Dr. Komatar, who is professor and the program director of our residency program and director of our uh, UM Brain, Brain Tumor Initiative and Surgical Neuro-Oncology, as well as uh, Dr. Benjamin, who's assistant professor, brain tumor and skull-based specialist and director of our um, skull-based lab called the Keynes Lab. Uh, each week we put on uh, this symposium focused on brain tumors and we couldn't do it with, without uh, great uh, administrative support uh, Christina, Ingrid, Roberto, and Ignacio um, are, are just outstanding, and, and I just want to say thank you to them for all of their help. Uh, if you have any questions about uh, tonight's seminar or, 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 or future webinars, you can always find us on social media. We are on uh, YouTube, uh, as well as Twitter and Instagram. Uh, you can also go to our website here, newjersey.med.miami.edu, and you can find out about this symposium, as well as all the other ones. Uh, that we host throughout the week. Uh, and that brings us to uh, some of the other symposiums that we have ongoing this week. Uh, Dr. Morcos will be uh, leading the way in the cerebrovascular skull base symposium tomorrow in a debate format talking about dural avia fistulas with Dr. Wrigley as well as Dr. Ziflil um, uh, and the panelists here below. Uh, so be sure to tune in uh, same time tomorrow from five to seven uh, to, to hear about their lecture. And just to remind you each Wednesday at five o'clock, we have our own uh, Miami Gold Brain Tumor Symposium. This week is number 17. Uh, and if you missed it or have to leave early, you could always find it on YouTube. Uh, for participants, please uh, use the Q&A button. We try to make this as interactive as possible. And we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. We don't offer CME, but you will get an email confirmation documenting participation. And please be sure to like, follow, and share um, us on social media and on YouTube so that we can continue to grow and share all the great knowledge of, of our amazing speakers. So this week we have an amazing group of panelists. Um, uh, Dr. Shambliss is an associate professor uh, in the Department of Neurosurgery and Radiation Oncology at Vanderbilt. Uh, she's a brain tumor skull based specialist and also her program, the program director. Uh, we have uh, Ricardo Comitor, who I've already introduced to the program director in our program and a brain tumor specialist. Dr. Codd, who is assistant professor uh, at Duke University, also uh, focused on endoscopic and minimally invasive surgery. He's also director of their brain tumor Brain Tool Laboratory and the Duke Robotics Program. And we have Dr. Hamp, who's the Assistant Professor and Specialist of New Invasive Surgery at uh, Westchester Medical Center. Uh, but tonight, uh, a special thanks goes out to, to our, our speaker, uh, who's joining us early morning from Australia, uh, Dr. Charlie Teo. Uh, Dr. Teo, over the last 30 years, has really uh, built a phenomenal practice and really an expertise that he's developed and, and, and kind of lead, led the way in the world on uh, keyhole minimally invasive surgery. Um, he's director of the Center for Minimally Invasive Neurosurgery at the Prince of Wales Private Hospital in Australia, uh, where he runs a very, very active and highly sought after fellowship in brain tumor endoscopic surgery, uh, which has really led to training some of the best surgeons in the world, including some of the panelists that we have here today. Uh, he's published over 120 papers on brain tumor and, and keyhole surgery, uh, including the two books that you could see above there, uh, focused on his techniques. Um, he's also acts as the Australian representative for the NAANS CNS uh, joint section for tumors. Um, but beyond uh, the hospital, he's also a tremendous advocate for research and philanthropist. Uh, he's a founder of the Cure Brain Cancer Foundation and the Charlie Tuyo Foundation which together have raised more than $20 million, I'm sure much more uh, now, uh, that's really been helping uh, scientists focused on medicine, but specifically on brain tumor research. Um, and, and for that, we're so thankful. So Dr. Teo, thank you for joining us uh, uh, super early uh, on the Thursday in Australia to talk to us tonight and, and educate the, uh, the world. Michael, that's a lovely introduction. Thank you very much. I'm now gonna just share my screen. So there's a lot to get through. So if you don't mind, I might just cut straight to the chase. Firstly, thank you. Uh, secondly, welcome to all my friends and colleagues out there for uh, taking the time to listen to this. And uh, if you don't mind, let's get straight into it. All 
Okay, disclaimers. I'm a co-founder of Omniscient, which I'll be talking about a little bit during the talk and a consultant for Esculap. Uh, so what are the principles of keyhole glioma surgery? Well, of course, as per usual, you should define the goals of surgery. Are you doing a biopsy or are you trying to achieve a gross total resection? You want to try and maximize impact, uh, impact and minimize morbidity. And then, of course, there are the basic uh, uh, tenets of keyhole surgery. And that is you must identify the long axis of the tumor and follow that trajectory to the surface. And that's where you're going to make your entry. Uh, you then position the patient uh, in such a way that you don't want to uh, require self-retaining retractors, which just clutters your small craniotomy. Uh, and then, of course, to further unclutter your small craniotomy, it's really good to use uh, modern technology uh, and utilize that maximally uh, to uh, achieve these resections via a, a minimally invasive approach. Uh, just as a pre-note, uh, of course, we all understand now the importance of a gross total resection. I think the literature is pretty clear now, whereas a few years ago, it was a bit ambiguous. Uh, now, it but definitely shows that all grades of glioma, a greater extent of resection results in longer survival times. Uh, and uh, clearly also, the benefit of a greater extent of resection is more significant the lower the grade. Therefore, it's very important to get as great a total resection as possible. And let's talk about these principles. What do I mean about the long axis or the two point rule? Well, one point should be placed on the deepest part of the lesion. Another point should be placed on the most superficial part of the lesion in its longest axis. And so you've got to make sure you examine all the different uh, planes, the coronal, axial and sagittal plane to find that long axis. Once you identify those two points, you carry those points to the surface and that's where you make your entry. You can see from this cartoon that in the olden days, we were always taught to make the entrance where it comes closest to the surface. If I had done this in this case, it would have given me good visualization of this portion of the tumor, which is a minor portion of the tumor and poor visualization of the majority uh, of the tumor, uh, which is better seen with the uh, two point rule. Just some examples of that. Remember, if a lesion is deep to the surface, then the craniotomy doesn't need to be big. And I would say that uh, anything more than two centimeters deep, deep to the surface, you can get away with a one and a half to two centimeter craniotomy, which basically is the size of a big burr hole. So this complete resection, and you can see the long axis, which was identified. We took that to the surface, small craniotomy, linear incision, which heals nicely, easy to open, easy to close, uh, and uh, good, good cosmetic uh, outcome. Here's another one, big lesion. So a lot of people think big lesion, big craniotomy. That's wrong. Big lesion can be done. This is about two centimeters deep to the surface. You can see here. And the angles that can be subtended through a small craniotomy are quite significant. So that again, as long as it's deep to the surface, you can do this through a burr hole type approach, complete resection. And again, a linear incision, which is a whole lot easier to open and close than a flap. Positioning, 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 like real estate, location, location, location. It's very, very important. And that's why the attending should be there uh, during the positioning of the patient to make sure that the trajectory is perpendicular to the floor. Now, what that means is, uh, I think you can imagine if you're operating at an angle like this, the brain is constantly falling into your corridor. You need to put a self-retaining retractor in there to hold it out of the way. All that does is cause infarction of brain and cluttering of your small craniotomy. So position the patient so that you're always perpendicular in all three planes. And so you rotate the patient around or move the patient around before you make your incision, before you start your operation, using uh, frameless geotactic guidance to help you pick those perpendicular planes. So you can see here, here's the patient position in a sort of standard way. I put the pointer in, I make sure it goes all the way down to the deepest part of the, part of the lesion. And you can see that my aim or my trajectory is quite angled, which means my brain is gonna fall into the corridor. So what I do then is I reposition the patient in all three planes so that the, the axis is perfectly perpendicular. That means you're gonna be operating straight down a hole. Brain's not gonna fall in. You don't need to put retractors in there uh, and you get good access to the deepest and darkest part of the lesion. Here's another case. There's the long axis in all three planes. You've got to examine it in all three planes and we rotate the patient, move the patient, 
so that we're operating in the perpendicular plane uh, in all three aspects. And again, this can then be done through a minimally invasive keyhole approach. You can see the axis, see the resection, <clears throat> and you can see how we obeyed those rules. Okay, what sort of technology do you need? Uh, well, unfortunately, a lot of this can't, can't be done with good technology. So let me just take you through that. Uh, so on this end, this is a program that Mike Chagru has developed, basically showing not only DTI and tracks, but also parcellations and cortical representations. It is a beautiful program that, uh, that we use preoperatively now to map out the brain uh, before we make any sort of cortical incision or retraction. If you don't have that, anyway, just as much information as you can get preoperatively can't hurt and can only improve things. Frameless stereotactic guidance, I wouldn't say is mandatory, but I can certainly say that it's very, very helpful, especially in positioning the patient to look for those three perpendicular planes. I like these fat bipolars. Uh, basically what they are is that the ends of the bipolars are so fat that the heat is uh, spread out evenly and it sort of melts the gliomas rather than chars them. Uh, and I think they're pretty essential when it comes to glioma surgery. Not only that, they come in all different angles, so you can use the endoscope and operate around corners. The endoscope is invaluable. You must be able to become very familiar with the endoscope and endoscopic views. Uh, you have to become facile with its use. Your nursing staff has to come, become very useful, uh, sorry, uh, familiar with its use, uh, because you're gonna be using it in every case. A lot of people criticize the endoscope because you often hold the endoscope in one hand, which means you become a one-handed surgeon. Well, technology has helped us uh, uh, get over that problem. And that is things like bipolar suckers. So you can hold one instrument that can bipolar and suck with one instrument. Uh, I'm not a consultant for this company, but it's, uh, it's a company that makes these variable length, malleable suction irrigators. Uh, and it's made by Kerwin, K-I-R-W-O-N. Uh, and it's not the ideal product, but it's, it's one of the better, on the better ones on the market. Uh, malleable, disposable, bipolar suckers, uh, so that you can operate round corners. When do you need to operate round corners? Well, when tumors have multiple axes, such as this butterfly glioma, you can see that this sort of axis is well uh, accessed by one approach, but it'd be very difficult to look around the corner uh, all this way out here. So you need angled views to do that. Sometimes tumors are hidden underneath eloquent brain like insular gliomas. Here's the long axis of this tumor. You're not gonna take it through eloquent brain. So in other words, you're gonna compromise. You're gonna do a trans approach, which gives you good access to this portion of the tumor, gives you terrible visualization of these parts hidden underneath the overlying opercula. How do you get them? It's all about endoscopic views. And then sometimes the surgical corridor is such that you can't get light into where you're operating. Here's the perfect example of that, the subfrontal approach to this uh, midbrain glioma. There's a trajectory, it's a nice trajectory, but look what's in the way. You've got the optic nerve, the carotid artery, the third nerve, the posterior clinoid. And you can imagine that getting light from a microscope is very difficult down that small window. That's where the endoscope becomes an invaluable tool because it takes the light source to the target and it doesn't get disseminated on, uh, dissipated on the way. Here's an example of bad surgery that I did. Uh, again, initial glioma. I did a trans sylvian approach plus a lobectomy for the uh, uh, extension into the temporal lobe. And you can see that I've skeletonized the MCA. That's nice. But look what's happened here. I've left all this tumor up here. And why? I can actually remember the case very well. It's because the endoscope was broken. I said to the nursing staff, oh, look, don't worry about it. I think I've got it all out. But clearly, if I put an endoscope in there, looked upwards, I would have seen a significant residual tumor. So don't compromise, make sure you do have all the tools available, make sure they're working uh, and, uh, and don't, uh, 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 don't accept anything uh, less than optimum. Here's an example of a good case. You can see that this uh, glioma turned out to be an AA, anaplastic gastrocytoma, has multiple axes. It's got this axis along here, it's got the long axis here. Are we gonna be able to take this out through one approach? Well, it'd be good if we could, and we can create such a large working space with one axis that of course you can put the endoscope in there, look around corners and take out the entire tumor through one burr hole type approach. Again, a burr hole because it's deep to the surface. Here's our craniotomy. You can see a complete resection, complete resection on T2 and T1, all done through an incision about the size of a burr hole and a craniotomy about the size of your thumbnail. 
Here's a really good example of how you maximize, uh, maximally utilize all your technology. So these chambers are actually more difficult than they appear. Why? Because uh, it's very difficult to reach out laterally. I mean, I find an interhemispheric approach gives you good access to this sort of portion of the tumor, but it gives you very poor access to the more lateral extents of the tumor without significant retraction of the brain. And that's why sometimes we do these through a contralateral approach. But I think if you look at the long axis here, the contralateral approach takes you straight through that bridging vein. And then there's this other bridging vein. So I don't know, you're starting to think, well, maybe I don't want to damage both sides of the brain. Maybe I have to do this through a unilateral approach. And then if you use the software that you have to map the brain and the parcellations, you'll find in fact that the window, the perfect window here is an ipsilateral window. But again, look at the ipsilateral approach. You never come completely midline because of the superior sagittal sinus. So it's a sort of almost like a paramedian approach, which can't give you good access to the lateral extent unless you look out laterally. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to cut short some of the videos because of time restraints. But essentially, this is the left side, interhemispheric approach, dural flap against the superior sagittal sinus. Significant bridging vein right here that I don't want to uh, uh, sacrifice. So what I'm doing is I'm kind of struggling doing an interhemispheric approach. This is very eloquent brain. This is a very eloquent vein. So I'm standard microsurgical technique. And I think by the time we get to this stage of the operation, you can see I'm really pulling on that bridging vein. It's getting depleted of blood. I'm starting to fear that it might thrombose soon or I might tear it. So I'm really having to reevaluate now the lateral extent of this glioma. Okay, so I give up at that stage and now I put in my endoscope. There's a few things I'd like to identify with this endoscopic view. Firstly, you can use different angled endoscopes, 30, 45, or 70, which gives you more and more of an angled look. Secondly, I want you to appreciate the fact that the differentiation of normal and abnormal brain is actually, I think, a little bit better with the endoscope because the light is so good, the magnification is so good uh, that you can actually tell that interface better than you can with a microscope almost. So good visualization, angled views, good magnification. This thing here that I'm using is malleable. So it means that you can bend it as as much as you like according to the uh, angle of the scope that you're using and there's no traction on the brain. So what we see here is a typical appearance of a low-grade glioma, this bland sort of shiny look. There's no normal brain at this stage, no petechiae of normal brain and I think in a minute here we are we're going to start seeing normal petechiae of normal brain. Here we go normal brain here, shiny bland glioma here, so, you know, that's the view you're getting with an endoscope. It's a beautiful view. It's probably better than the microscope. And here you go now, normal brain. So the interface is clearly defined. A little bit of tumor, still a little bit of tumor here. And there's no retraction on the brain. So here's the incision. It's quite a big incision. The reason being is because, again, you want to try and operate between those bridging veins. So if the bridging vein happens to be right in the middle of your craniotomy. You want to go either forward or backwards. So I guess the craniotomy has to be almost double the size that you're normally going to do. Here's the tumor pre-op. Post-op, you can see that we've got a complete resection out laterally. And again, no footprints. Here's the ipsilateral approach. Brain's not damaged over overlying and we've reached out all the way laterally simply because we used endoscopic guidance. Okay, I'm now gonna talk about the application of these keyhole principles to some very difficult gliomas. Uh, gliomas that some people consider inoperable because of their location, their bilateral uh, involvement, uh, the surrounding structures, butterfly gliomas, for example. How do we get to the other side? Mesial occipital gliomas, how do we take them out without damaging the optic radiation? Flamic gliomas, bad juju. Brainstem gliomas, well, there's so many cranial nerves around there. It's such an eloquent area. How do we get to them? Uh, and then insular gliomas, Michael and Ivan, uh, uh, Michael and uh, Richard Ricardo wanted me to talk more in depth about them, and we'll do that at the end of this talk. 
So butterfly gliomas, you always approach from the non-dominant side if they truly butterfly and there's no sort of inequality between each side's involvement. Uh, the craniotomy, of course, is very small because why? It's deep to the surface, so it never has to be more than about a centimeter and a half in diameter. Uh, I make a, uh, an incision behind a hairline for anterior corpus callosal butterfly gliomas uh, and a retroauricular incision for the posterior splenial butterfly gliomas. I think one of the most important things is to identify the fornices first. A lot of people look at these x-rays and think, oh, gee, the fornices are involved, I'm, I'm gonna destroy uh, memory. As a basic rule, if their memory is intact before surgery, you can have an intact patient after surgery. So it's extremely important to identify the fornices up front and separate the tumor off the fornices. And in this situation, you think they're involved, but they're not. Uh, and uh, you can get a clean resection of the tumor off the fornices first up. This cartoon demonstrates exactly what I just mentioned, and that is microsurgical resection of the ipsilateral portion and endoscopic resection of the contralateral portion. Here's a case of a multifocal type uh, GBM. Uh, we want to take it all out at once, uh, all the foci. Uh, this is a left frontal lobectomy. And I'll just take you through, it's a standard left frontal lobectomy. And as we now get down, here's a A2 complex. Here's the free edge of the falx. Uh, still unilateral. Okay, radio. So once we've done the lobectomy, you can see here's A1, A2, corpus callosum's gone. Here's the falx. We put the endoscope in because remember it goes to the other side as well. And you don't want to retract these uh, vascular uh, tissue that much. Now we're in the ventricle on the other side. Here's the chordate head on the right side. This is the uh, forceps uh, uh, minor. And here's this angled sucker bipolar. So I'm holding the scope with my left hand and I'm operating as a two-handed surgeon with a hybrid instrument with my right hand. And again, I'd like you to uh, appreciate the easy identification of tumor brain interface using excellent illumination, magnification, and angled views. So we haven't retracted this at all. We haven't damaged the cingulate gyrus on the other side. We've done purely endoscopic resection of the contralateral portion. And you can see here's the lobectomy and here's the uh, resection of the contralateral portion using endoscopic guidance through a keyhole craniotomy. These patients can do very well. We've published our, pay, uh, our series of butterfly gliomas and the survival is almost as good, well, it's good as, if not a little bit better actually, than standard uh, GBMs in any other location. Uh, again, please identify the long axis. There's the long axis, it's taking us anteriorly. It's a midline tumor. We don't need to go out too laterally. So it's a midline small craniotomy, keyhole craniotomy, uh, and uh, complete resection. Here's a splenial one. Just remember the optic radiation, go below the optic radiation, reach across the other side using the endoscope. Uh, and uh, here's another one. Okay, so this looks like it's a midline one. It doesn't extend too laterally. You think you might be able to do this through one single approach. But remember, you've got to look at all the different axes. Look at the coronal axis. I would contend that a ipsilateral microsurgical approach will get you this portion of the tumor. The endoscope would probably get you this portion of the tumor. But to reach this far laterally on the other side would be near impossible. Uh, and therefore, again, look at the long axes. How are we going to approach this? And I decided to do this through a bilateral approach both keyholes, and again, achieved a complete resection with a very good neurological outcome. And you can see the two tracks here along the two axes. Does it impact survival? Yes, it does. And again, we've published that with butterfly gliomas, we can extend their mean survival from an average of six months in the literature to 16 months with the same radical resection that you give to patients with gliomas in other locations. These have always presented a difficult a challenge to us. Why? Because if a tumor is lateral to the occipital horn, then by definition, it has almost always destroyed the optic radiation. But tumors that are medial to the occipital horn, no matter how big they are, they seem to stretch those fibers, but don't cause visual, uh, uh, visual field defects. So they've always presented a challenge to us. Not only 
does the optic radiation present a challenge, but also does IFOF uh, along that lateral border. They talk about a safe window coming laterally. I would contend that that safe window is good in a lot of patients, but everyone's anatomy is different. And again, with preoperative planning and these fantastic uh, software packages that we can have now, uh, we can try and identify those safe windows and find that in fact, in many cases, there's really not a very safe window coming laterally for these tumors. Hence the skid approach for lesions of the mesial occipital lobe. Uh, this has been well documented in the literature recently, uh, the supracerebellar infratentorial approach to the mesial temporal, mesial occipital, because you want to try and avoid uh, IFOF optic radiation and DMN. This is the way I do it. Uh, I used to do them prone, then I did them lateral decubitus, now I do them supine with the head turned, but it's a suboccipital incision about two centimeters away from the midline, sorry, two finger breadths away from the midline, which is about two and a half, three centimeters from the midline. It's a paramedian approach, very wide opening of the, of the tent, and of course you want to do that so it doesn't impede you or create another hurdle. Uh, and these mesial lesions, believe it or not, this was an airline pilot with uh, normal visual fields, uh, and a complete resection. You can see the tentorial opening is wide. It's a skid approach, supracerebellar, infratentorial, transtentorial, with a wide opening, uh, and going through a very non-eloquent brain for a complete resection. Large tumors can be done through that technique. Uh, even meningiomas can be done through that technique. Uh, again, really wide opening of the tent complete resection, and I'd really like to say that none of our patients that we've used a skid on have had a visual field defect, and you can see no footprints and oh, no visual fields post-operatively. Thalamic again, presented a real challenge to us because they're surrounded by such eloquent brain. In no case has it been more important to determine the long axis, so please really, really take your time examining the scans in all different planes to find that long axis. Again, they're deep to the surface. A small craniotomy is all you need. The endoscope is invaluable. And I found that a lot of these patients who have preoperative hemiparesis, you think they might get better after surgery by taking away the mass effect. They don't seem to. But if they don't have a preoperative hemiparesis, then they usually do, do very well after surgery. The different approaches, I won't go into them if you don't mind, but there's many different approaches to the uh, thalamus. I'll just show you a few of them. This doesn't extend laterally, so this was an interhemispheric approach. This one did extend laterally, and it was multifocal. So the long axis takes us basically to the other side. Again, a complete resection, good outcome. This one here, where's the long axis here? Kind of looks like it takes us transtemporal, but that would take us straight through the optic radiation. This one, eh. Maybe transylvian, but that will jeopardize your, uh, your uh, corticospinal. But here we go. Look at the sagittal. Sagittal shows the long axis, takes us through a beautiful trajectory through this sulcus and the superior parietal lobule. So we did this uh, superior parietal lobule approach, positioning the patient so that you don't need retractors. In other words, you're always operating perpendicular. Here's where the patient had a biopsy at St. Elsewhere's. And again, the craniotomy is smaller than uh, the biopsy site, and it's about the size of a large burr hole. I want to show you this video because there's this, this is trend these days where people are using uh, tubular retractors. I'm, I'm not quite sure why, uh, because with good technique and good positioning, you don't need any retractors. Uh, and in fact, this video is really indicative of how much you actually utilize the natural elasticity of the brain to look into the different angles of this tumor, uh, different uh, crevices of this tumor. So I think you'll see in this video that if I had a tube in there, uh, restricting the movement of the natural elasticity of the brain and the natural ability to retract brain, it would do nothing but impede your uh, mobility and versatility. So I'm constantly moving around, I'm changing my angle of view, I'm changing the angle of my microscope. I'm using the natural elasticity of the brain to reach out to those corners of this tumor. And, uh, and I'm doing it all through a minimally invasive keyhole approach uh, with a very, very minimally invasive uh, corridor as well. Again, it's, you see how I triangulate the instruments, uh, the bipolar in one hand, the sucker in the other hand, always moving them around like this so that you can uh, uh, keep that uh, uh, corridor open. You don't need a uh, 
a tubular retractor. And I think if anything, a tubular retractor would uh, impede uh, your ability to get into the different uh, uh, portions of this tumor. Again, a complete resection, good outcome. Here's another one. It's a transtemporal, transventricular approach, small craniotomy, small incision, complete excision, and maintenance of the optic tract. This is a transsylvian approach. This is the multifocal GBM that was written off by other neurosurgeons. They simply just biopsied this portion, didn't even address this portion, and he's a young man. Again, look at the axes. Here's the sylvian fissure. This one, of course, is done superficially. And I think you can appreciate the big dangerous one, i.e. the thalamic one, we did through a small incision, small craniotomy, and the more simple one uh, had to have a bigger craniotomy because it came to the surface. So that whole principle, if it comes to the surface, of course, you've got to expose the surface projection. If it doesn't come to the surface, then of course, you can do it through a small craniotomy. Uh, this video, I don't need to show it, but essentially it's just uh, uh, the usual technique of splitting the fissure and then using uh, your instruments without any retraction because we've positioned the patient perfectly so that we, the brain is not falling in on, on, on you. Here's pre-op and again post-op showing a complete resection. Uh, again, a trans approach, complete resection, complete resection of this one. Uh, and uh, again, a very good outcome, no deficits. Brainstem gliomas have again presented a challenge to us. Why? Because of, not only because it's in the brainstem, but because they're surrounded by very important neurovascular structures, cranial nerves, basilar artery, uh, aica, pica. Uh, so we've often steered clear of uh, trying to achieve a complete gross total resection for brainstem gliomas. You must differentiate diffuse from focal. Never has it been so important. If it's diffuse, you can't achieve a complete radical resection. If it's focal, absolutely you can. So you've really got to look at all the different sequences on your MRI scan to see whether it's focal or diffuse. Again, the craniotomy is small because it's deep. Endoscopy is invaluable. It is high risk surgery, but we've published our series of brainstem gliomas. In fact, the results are very, very good. Uh, most people after surgery are either better or the same neurologically. It's, it's, it's actually uncommon to get patients who are worse. I just showed this one as a perfect example of something that was previously diagnosed as diffuse and inoperable uh, uh, midline uh, glioma. But if you look carefully, there's a very clear markation here, demarcation here. This is, you can't get more focal than this. This is a focal medullary brainstem glioma this is normal brainstem that's stretched around it and it's a very clear demarcation. So that can, you can achieve a complete resection of that tumor. Here's another one, this is much easier of course because it's a JPA, complete resection. And again, these big craniotomies are totally unnecessary. This was biopsied at some other place and we took it out through this very small uh, transcortical, transventricular, transchoroidal approach uh, to the midbrain, a good outcome. Endoscope, invaluable. Why? Because this corner down here is very difficult to access for a retro-sig. Retro-sig, you can really retract the cerebellum if you like, or you can resect cerebellum, but why do that? And all you've got to do is put an endoscope in and look around that corner and get a complete resection of these focal brainstem gliomas. Here's another one. This is focal. Again, diagnosed as diffuse, but here, look, this is normal brainstem. This is a normal brainstem, and this is all tumor. Complete resection, here's the normal brainstem preserved. Here's the patient two days after surgery. Here's a focal GBM of the brainstem, complete resection. He was out of hospital four hours after surgery because it was so focal, all done through a minimally invasive approach. Anaplastic astrocytoma, good outcome, complete resection, alive 10 years after surgery, despite being, uh, being a grade three brainstem glioma. JPA, I've already shown this case all done through an eyebrow uh, and good long-term survival, no footprints. This one was again diagnosed as a DPG, D DMG, diffuse midline glioma. I think you can see why, because everyone looked at it and said, well, it's ventral, the basilar artery is symmetrically encased, but it doesn't have the crossing, uh, cross crossing pontocerebellar fibers, which is a hallmark of diffuse tumors. So again, a red flag should have been raised immediately no crossing pontocerebellar fibers, or maybe it's not diffuse, maybe it's actually focal. And if you look at this sequence, 
T1 with contrast, you can again see this very clear demarcation right here. Do this through a keyhole craniotomy, it's a keyhole retro SIG, very small incision. And again, we need the endoscope to reach back dorsally here to get this, uh, to find this border back here. This, in fact, wasn't a DMG. It was, in fact, a ventrally exophytic medullary focal JPA, complete resection and a complete resection on T2 using the endoscope looking backwards. And a good neurological outcome and a small uh, retro SIG uh, craniotomy. And of course, it does impact survival. We've published our series. If they're low grade, you can look at uh, Kaplan Meier curves that look as good as this. Unfortunately, if they're high grade, we probably don't extend their lives that much, maybe a little bit longer, but uh, we certainly improve their quality of life. Okay, so uh, Michael and Ricardo asked me to concentrate on, uh, on uh, insular gliomas. I think I'm running out of time, so uh, maybe we'll spend about, I don't know, you can spend about 10 minutes on these. Hobby horse when it comes to intracellular gliomas, I know the current literature and many of the doyens of glioma surgery are advocating awake surgery for all intracellular gliomas. I'm actually advocating exactly the opposite. I think they can be done just as effectively, if not better, when they're asleep. So I'm gonna talk about awake versus asleep. I'm gonna talk about how to address the extensions beyond the limiting sulci. Uh, and I'm gonna show you some pretty good results from insular gliomas. Okay, why under general anesthetic? Well, some people prefer that, so you've got to listen to them. Uh, we have Mike Chagru and his fantastic uh, software now, so we can get lots and lots of information preoperatively. Uh, this whole concept of super resection, I think it's impossible when it comes to insular gliomas. You know, it's not the area where you want to cut into normal brain. Uh, it's not the area where you can do a super resection. You've got to try and stick to the tumor margins. So in other words, if you're doing an anatomical resection and not a functional resection, then of course you don't have to have them awake. Uh, a lot of people say you have to have them awake because you do a transcortical or transopercular approach. Well, you don't have to. People only have to go through a normal brain if they aren't facile with the endoscope. Uh, in other words, if you can't reach those deep areas underneath the opercular, if you're facile with the endoscope and you can do endoscopic tumor resection, you don't need to go transcortical or transopercular. You can do them all through a trans uh, sylvian approach using endoscopic guidance. Sometimes you see premature uh, termination of the operation when you do a wake surgery because the patient either becomes anxious, uh, you get some funny odd symptoms, uh, and then you do the post-op scan, you see significant tumor burden left behind, and you think, oh God, I, 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 I could have gone further. Many of the post-op deficits improve with plasticity. We all see that. So when you do them asleep, they wake up, they're a bit hemiparetic in the recovery room, but by the time they get to the ward, they're back to normal. And these patient, patients would have had termination of their operation with residual tumor had you done them awake. Why not awake? Well, it's difficult or impossible to monitor some of the other more subtle neurological functions of the insula, such as interoception. And interoception, or the lack of empathy towards oneself or others, can be quite debilitating, almost as debilitating, I think, as a, a memory disorder. Uh, firstly, nextly, it doesn't uh, guarantee a perfect neurological outcome. Oncological survival may be reduced. Uh, and it does require a dedicated team which a lot of developing countries can't, uh, uh, can't afford. Uh, and most people who monitor say that bad monitoring is probably uh, worse than uh, no monitoring at all. Uh, so how do I do it? I do uh, a transylvian approach in most cases, transcortical, if the cortex is involved, of course, or uh, it's a mini craniotomy, uh, it's mini terrional craniotomy, exposed to sylvian fissure, uh, wide opening of the sylvian fissure, and then uh, standard microsurgical technique once the fissure is open uh, to get down to the insula. So here we go. This is the bulging insula. This is the uh, temporal operculum, frontal operculum. These branches of the MCA are en passant. In other words, they need to be preserved. And these branches are what uh, we call the circumflex branches or the insular branches can be sacrificed. So you're operating through the windows uh, between the MCA branches and sacrificing insular branches, but not sacrificing en passant branches. 
Uh, again, this is just a, uh, oh, this is a case there where the temporal lobe was in affected. So we're going to do a temporal lobectomy to improve our visualization of the insula. So this is just a standard temporal lobectomy first to expose the insular component next. Sometimes I do go transcortical. And again, the principle of long axis, look at the long axis of this insular glioma. It takes us anteriorly. So I did this through an eyebrow approach, transcortical uh, eyebrow, and again, a complete resection and complete resection uh, with a good outcome. And cosmetic results, very good. Stage two is where you basically take out the insular glioma. And remember the importance of the endoscope, and I'm gonna show you now that in a video. Transylvanian will get you this portion. And we're running out of time, so I'm just gonna show you how the, uh, again, we're now we're putting the uh, uh, sucker underneath the opercula, and again, really good visualization of the interface. Stage three is identifying the medial extent. In other words, how deep do you go? You certainly don't want to damage this structure here, which is the uh, LSA. Uh, and the way I do it is to identify the occipital, uh, sorry, the frontal horn superiorly, uh, chordate head uh, intermediate, uh, or LSA is inferiorly. So that will stop you from going too medial. Is the M1. Here's the LSAs projecting post row superiorly. We identify them early in the piece so that we don't damage them and we don't go too medial. And there they are again in the coronal view. There's tumor beyond them. And how do we identify them? Again, make sure you show the uh, M1. Uh, once you show the M1, of course, you can see the LSAs coming off the uh, posterior part of them and that will show your medial extension. There's the LSAs, there's M1, and we know we're not gonna go any more deep, uh, deeper or medial than that. And again, always make sure you can identify the chordate head. Yazigal, uh, one of his greatest contributions to neurosurgery is to describe the chordate head as cut nutmeg, and it looks exactly like cut nutmeg. This is cut nutmeg, and this is the chordate head. It's a yellow sort of background with white squiggly lines, just like this, uh, and that's when you know you've hit the chordate head or body. Stage four is where you take that deep part, and I would contend that you need very, very good technique, and I'd make sure you had a few insular gliomas under your belt before you start going medial to the LSAs. Uh, this video shows me doing that. This is the MCA trunk. We've taken out the insular glioma. We've preserved the overlying opercula. It's been a trans approach. Here are the LSAs. And unfortunately, this is where the tumor has extended medial to the LSAs. So what do you do when that happens? Well, it, again, very, very uh, refined technique to take this out because you want to try and preserve these. And here we are coagulating glioma. We have very controlled suction because your sucker will damage these LSAs if you're not careful. And basically we're skeletonizing the LSAs and there's an LSV right there. And having got a few of these under my belt, I've damaged maybe one or two LSAs in a few cases and thankfully you can get away with that. If you damage more than two uh, lenticulostriate arteries and you're in big trouble, you're gonna get a, a bad outcome. So again, very, very gentle retraction, very gentle coagulation. Very gentle suction because suction will damage these LSAs and you've just got to make sure you preserve all of them uh, with this tumor that's made. And there we go again, we're operating between the, the lenticulostriate arteries in this situation. I just want to show you some of the results and this will be the end now. It's not to show off, but it's to basically show you that you can do this asleep with good anatomical resections and good outcomes. Uh, this was a series that we published uh, about five years ago. There's many more than that now. Uh, of the 88 patients who had insular gliomas, 62 of them had an excellent, uh, excellent outcome. That is no permanent deficits and a gross total resection. And again, a lot of people don't believe this, so I'm just going to briefly whiz through these. And I, can, I think you can see that what we do is you have to maintain this medial edge, get a complete resection, and we get good outcomes. And it's all about identifying the edge and it's all about good technique, good surgical technique. It's not necessarily about intraoperative monitoring or awake surgery. It's all about identifying the interface. Gross total resections on T1 and T2, 
shaving it off those medial components. And all these patients had no neurological deficits. They did have a little bit of temporary hemiparesis, especially if I fiddled around with the LSVs. Uh, and here's, here's a group that I really want to show you. So out of those 62 patients with a gross total resection uh, and good neurological outcome, seven of them had, done, had been done by, you know, patient, uh, surgeons with a lot of experiences from all around the world uh, awake. And when they did them awake, they left tumor behind. Patients didn't like that. They came to me uh, and I took out the rest of the tumor with good outcomes. Okay, so here's one of them. So here's a resection done by a very famous neurosurgeon overseas. We've done a complete resection, complete recovering a marathon. Here's another one. Here's the resection terminated by a very famous neurosurgeon in the States, residual tumor, complete resection. After a wake surgery, again, residual tumor, after a wake surgery, complete resection, good outcome, complete resection, good outcome. And these are some tumors that we purposely leave tumor behind. Of course, you don't want to dig into this area here. This is all T2 changes within the basal ganglia. So this is cases where we purposely left tumor behind, just took out the insular component. And these are some tumors where I left tumor behind accidentally. I'm not quite sure why, but I just didn't get it all completely. And so these were considered good, but not great, uh, some residual tumor. Okay, so is it all worthwhile? Well, it is. Uh, operative times are shorter, opening and closing is shorter, less post-operative pain. Uh, we've published our results on 890 retrosigmoid approaches, uh, keyhole retrosigmoid approaches, only uh, one CSF leak and only three take-backs uh, out of, uh, out of uh, over 5,500 brain tumors. This was uh, our tabulation results back in 2012. So you can really reduce your uh, craniomy related complications with these keyhole approaches. The hospital stay is reduced, less collateral damage, better cosmetic outcomes. And there's this one point that I'd really like to underscore as my final say, and that is a lot of these patients are having proactive multiple surgeries, what Mitch Berger calls turning an acute disease into a chronic disease. Well, the last thing you want is to restrict the number of craniotomies you're gonna perform on a patient because of complications with the scalp or complications with the incision. These small linear incisions don't get the same devascularization that you get with large flaps. And it does allow you to do multiple craniotomies. So here's a patient who presented in 2002, uh, had a biopsy somewhere else, came to me in 2004, had a complete resection. He didn't want uh, any damage, so I left a little bit behind in his insula. It grew back, took it out, took it out. Six craniotomies, six craniotomies over a period of about 14 years. Good neurological outcomes, no dysphagia, no hemiparesis. That was him 10 years after diagnosis. Uh, and then unfortunately it turned to a GBM. And when it turned into GBM, and we still did surgery, we still bought him some time. Uh, and I show this because this was his last operation after six craniotomies, and you can barely see the incision. There's no devascularization, no wasting of the temporalis muscle. In other words, six operations through the one incision, and you can barely even see where it is. And that uh, really does change your whole risk benefit ratio. So he had a gymnastic astrocytoma, T67 of 30% when he first presented, six craniotomies and overall survival of 14 years with six operations and never stayed in hospital more than a couple of days. So I'd like to conclude by saying that uh, we definitely know that we have to do a complete resection if possible. Uh, you've got to very, follow some very simple principles of very, very accurate and obsessive preoperative planning, utilization of current endoscopy, uh, sorry, uh, uh, instrumentation, especially endoscopy, uh, and uh, uh, and endoscopy does decrease the amount of collateral damage, improves your visualization, it enables the surgeon to look underneath the opercula, and it does define that brain tumor interface very, very well. Uh, in a select group of patients with low-grade intraglomerulus gliomas who are willing to accept a higher chance of post-operative neurological deficits for a likely survival benefit, non-awake surgery is a reasonable option. Non-awake surgery is a preferred option in non-cooperative or pediatric patients. 
uh, and outcomes will be optimized by extensive preoperative functional and anatomical imaging, good knowledge of the anatomy, especially IFOF, respecting uninvolved brain or the overlying opercula. In other words, don't go through the opercula unless it's involved by tumor. Endoscopic assistance, look for those hidden portions uh, and uh, good rehabilitation. Thank you. Thank you. That was, uh, that was an outstanding talk with, with definitely impressive outcomes. So congratulations on, on all of that for sure. Uh, so many questions here. Let's just see if we can get through a couple of them real quick before we get to our cases. Um, management of, of intraoperative uh, edema or, or large tumors with midline shift uh, preoperatively. Do you approach them any differently um, or, or would you still consider a keyhole surgery on those? Absolutely keyhole. In fact, the keyhole it's, it's so small, the dual opening is so small that you don't get the herniation of the brain through the craniotomy you do, like you do when you do a large craniotomy. So what it does, it gives you time to get uh, conditions better. You know, a little bit of head up, a bit of mannitol, hyperventilation, uh, uh, score the arachnoid to let some CSF out, and it gives you time to sort of relax, chill for the brain to settle down, and you don't get the herniation through the dural opening like you get with a big opening. Uh, and the other question was uh, intraoperative guidance to understand extent of resection. Do you use any adjuvant, adjuvants like 5-ALA or intraoperative MRI to kind of confirm, or is it all purely based on visualization with the, with the endoscope? It's based on visualization, and I'm so sorry that it's hard to describe, but it's something that you really need to watch me do. And uh, all, all the fellows will attest to this, you know, after a few weeks of watching me identify that interface, it becomes sort of very easy. But it's, I don't know, books don't quite get the message across. Yazigul talked about using all your senses. You've got to feel it. You've got to feel the firmness or the softness. You've got to identify the visual difference with uh, high magnification. Uh, you've got to listen to it as it goes up the sucker. Uh, tumor sounds like snot or like mucus, whereas uh, brain never sounds like that. Uh, you've got to coagulate it with those fat bipolars because when you coagulate it, tumor will bubble and, and sort of melt whereas uh, brain was char, char. And then you've got to be able to identify those petechiae of normal brain. Uh, uh, so it's a whole lot of t different techniques, but yeah, I, I, don't, I don't use any intraoperative aids apart from uh, bipolars. Uh, and then there's just a bunch of questions confirming uh, the use of intraoperative ma ma uh, mapping uh, with stimulation next to eloquent areas. Do you uh, map through the keyhole approach um, in order to ensure that you're close to motor fibers or is it basically an or just anatomical? No, there are some there are some circumstances where you want to do that. There's some circumstances where you want to do a super resection, but I'm not a good monitor. I'm a little bit impatient, uh, so I basically refer them to people who are good uh, at awake surgery and good monitoring. You know, Mike Chagru, there's a guy called Tim Sue in Australia who, who's well trained. So I refer them to people who do a lot of awake surgery. Uh, the other question was. Uh, for the, you, you kind of described your bimanual technique with the, with the endoscope, but people are asking if you've used a chop te chopstick technique where you have multiple instruments in one hand and the endoscope in the other hand to see if you can <laughs> optimize it. Uh, I think people are just really curious as how you manipulate the endoscope at the same time using the, the, the cautery and the suction so well. Yeah, yeah. Again, it's, uh, I guess there's a general principle. I don't like scope holders. So that's the first thing. So it has to be held by a human, either yourself or your assistant. I don't let the assistant hold it when I'm operating through a very fine window, like an optico carotid window, because uh, it's just too risky. Uh, but I will hold, let the assistant hold it when it's less eloquent area. But mostly it's me holding it and operating as a two-handed surgeon with a hybrid instrument. Now, before we had hybrid instruments, yeah, sure, you're a one-handed surgeon, it's, it's not ideal. Uh, but with these hybrid instruments now, you can bipolar and suck with the one hand and hold the scope with the other. And any any uh, uh, guidance for techniques for how to prevent um, the, the, the actual uh, tumor resection cavity collapsing with the suction uh, if, you're, if your opening is so small? Is it just manipulation uh, of how you hold it or is it use some kind of um, you know, cottonoid to always kind of keep that pressure open? Uh, that's a good question from someone who's obviously done a lot of keyhole surgery because you're right. If you've got a very narrow corridor and you've got a sucker in there, sometimes the whole thing collapses down. And, uh, no, you know, look, that happens occasionally, but it doesn't happen that often. And again, it's all about, tri it's all about triangulating. 
high polars in one hand, uh, a sucker in the other hand, and always doing this so that when you move it this way, the sucker moves this way, so it keeps the keeps the corridor open. Great, great. Okay, yeah, I don't want to waste too many more time, so let's get to our panelist. Uh, Lola, do you want to start? Sure, thank you. Let me get my screen up there. Just one second. Okay, um, Michael, can you see that all right? Yeah, you're still, we see closely the whole power. Oh yeah, now it looks good. Yeah, you're good. Okay, great. Uh, so thanks so much for having me, um, Michael and the rest of the team. Uh, it's really an honor to be here and uh, to get to share a case with you all. Um, I'm, uh, as Michael said, uh, a brain tumor and skull-based surgeon at Vanderbilt and I was Charlie's fellow in 2012. Uh, so it's been really enjoyable to listen to this talk and remember uh, so many of those things that I learned from him. And I hope a bunch of my residents are on here today and probably nodding their heads and realizing uh, where I got so many of the things that I try to instill in them every day. Uh, so I'm just gonna show one case that is just a case that I had a week ago, actually. 55 year old female who presented um, to our uh, hospital as a transfer. She had gone to an outside hospital with about two weeks of gait disturbance, number of falls, uh, and some nausea and vomiting, which was new for her. Her family had noted a two to three history of a slow cognitive decline that they were concerned might be some sort of early dementia. Uh, in terms of her past medical history, she has a rare, rare congenital syndrome um, causing syndactyly, but otherwise uh, nothing particularly concerning. And so this was her, um, her CT scan, a non-contrasted CT scan that was sent with her from the outside hospital. And um, I don't know, Charlie, if you want to take a second to describe what you see there or what you think that this is. Yeah, so it shows a nice so dense uh, midline uh, tumor uh, sitting probably in the third ventricle, possibly, yeah, probably in the third ventricle, uh, secondary hydrocephalus, pretty tight brain. Uh, uh, homogeneous, well, sorry, not homogeneous, in fact, heterogeneous, but no, but you can't tell because there's no contrast. So I'm thinking some sort of midline, third ventricular, pretty low grade tumor to get to that size, maybe a neurocytoma. Yeah, that was the top of my list too. Um, the MRI um, in this player here. Shows, um, shows this mass as well. Um, I'll show you the, the, the post contrast in a moment as well, but it's a non-enhancing tumor. It's actually within the lateral ventricles and, and in, in reality kind of arises from the septum pellucidum, um, yeah. which was very obvious when we got in there intraoperatively. And so this is, she, there's a lot of move, motion artifact on the scan, unfortunately, but this is the T1 post contrast, uh, sagittal and then coronal demonstrating that a little bit more clearly. Um, and so as you said, neurocytoma was certainly at the top of my list, although I was concerned about other intraventricular gliomas like ependymoma or subependymoma. Um, any thoughts on how you would personally approach this, Charlie? Yeah, definitely through an interhemispheric transcolosal approach. Uh, I don't know which side I'd go from, but maybe the right side and yeah, maybe the right side, and I'd be using the endoscope to get a lot of that stuff out of the left side, but I, I'm hoping that as you take out the right side, the left side's going to fall in. Good. Well, then I learned the right way. I haven't forgotten what I learned, I guess. So when I look at this, um, I thought, you know, first about the long axis of the tumor. This tumor is really a sphere, so it doesn't truly yeah. have a long axis that you need to be concerned about. So when I think about where we're going to approach it in the sagittal plane, we obviously want to be fairly anterior. We really want to be well in front of premotor cortex because we know that we're going to be worried about draining veins um, coming into the superior sagittal sinus. And we, we want to basically split the difference perhaps between the hairline and the coronal suture. Uh, as to exactly where we are in that line, I don't think it matters too much. 
Um, when we look at it in the coronal plane, I agree interhemispheric approach is the easiest and the most um, probably the safest for this. I chose the right hand side simply because it's the non-dominant side. Either one would be acceptable, but when you have the option, you might as well um, go from the right interhemispheric approach. So looking at the patient's head, uh, in terms of how I plan this incision. You can do this in the coronal plane. You can also do a paramedian sagittally oriented incision. Uh, this is the incision I chose. In general here, it's about a centimeter on the left of the superior sagittal sinus, two centimeters on the right. When you get in here to do your craniotomy, I always start with my safer burr hole way off to the side. And then my large um, burr hole that really extends in an AP direction across the superior sagittal sinus my craniotomy. And the key here is that I want to make sure I maximize my exposure in the AP direction. We don't need to see much of the lateral brain off to the right, but we know that we may have a draining vein that we're going to encounter that's going to push us one direction or the other. And that's where the, um, st the stereotaxis is really critical here. When we planned our initial incision, we put our stereotaxis on before we shaved anything, and we could see we were right over a big draining vein. And so then we just move a little bit forward. Uh, and, and you know forward's gonna be safer, so if you got the option, you might as well go a little bit forward. And then by the time we got in there, that vein was right at the back of our craniotomy, and uh, we could see it and preserve it throughout the case. Um, I'm gonna just jump ahead to kind of show a graphical image of what this approach looks like as you come down through the um, corpus callosum. It's always critical, the critical structure you want to identify are the pericolosal arteries. Sometimes you need to operate between them. That's fairly common. In this particular case, they both fell off to the left, um, which is nice because then you've just got them entirely out of the way. I actually love this image, which I just pulled off the internet because you can see in that top corner um, the craniotomy and the incision someone else is doing to get to this area. And uh, I think you can see that what we're proposing here is a lot less invasive that gets you to the same place. So here's our post-op imaging. Um, in that sagittal image, you can see our craniotomy pretty well. So you can see the size of that craniotomy, which is about inch, inch and a half. Uh, you can see a little bit of sort of, you know, retraction edema in the brain um, on our corridor coming in. We did not use any, any fixed retractors. We didn't use any retractors at all. Um, this was just done with the suction as a retractor. Um, and we were able to get a nicer section of this tumor, which uh, turned out to be a subependymoma. And I won't bore you with the details of that. Um, but Wanted to ask Charlie if you had any thoughts about that. Um, you mentioned the endoscope. We actually didn't use the endoscope in this case. Uh, this tumor really was very well circumscribed and kind of came to us. Um, but, you know, I think that, that that's really critical when you have something that's adherent on the contralateral ventricle. Mm -hmm. okay, the only comment is that, you know, I, I teach that you should use the endoscope every case because even if you don't need it, it gets your staff familiar with using it and it's never a hassle then when you ask for it because I know they're going to ask for it, you're going to ask for it anyway. So that's the only comment I'd make. You know, it would have been a nice thing to put the endoscope in the end there to have a look around, show, show your students and your residents good anatomy uh, and see if there's any residual tumour. But that's my only comment. Otherwise, perfect case, except that I used to say one and a half centimeters and you've now changed it to one and a half inches, Lola. It's typical, <laughs> <laughs> the American take on it. Metric system. Uh, anyway, great, great result. Great case, thank you. Great case, Lola. One question for you. Do you ever, uh, you know, for this was a very large tumor, obviously, and it was coming up to the, to the corpus callosum. Do you ever try to plan that initial entry into the ventricle either just slightly in front or slightly behind uh, the tumor where you know you're gonna find CSF early rather than coming right down on where the tumor, because I find that it's sometimes it's, I see your trajectory here is coming right to where that tumor, um, you know, uh, callosum interface is. Uh, and then sometimes if it was a central neurocytoma, you get into that kind of bloody friable tissue early rather than trying to, uh, you know, outline the outside of the tumor first. Yep, I think that's a great question. I think if you can get in in front of it, that's hugely helpful because then you can just work in one direction. Um, you know, here I didn't want to come far enough back that would have really put me behind it. Um, you know, and, and so I felt like we just have to be very careful right as you do that final cut through the rest, through, you know, final suction really through the corpus callosum to make sure you see the tumor, kind of press it down a little bit and establish that plane and get some CSF off. But here we did very much have to like work our way posterior for a while and then turn around and work our way anterior, um, which is not as ideal as being able to basically operate in a single direction because you've already established, um, you know, one of the margins of your resection. That's a great point.
Great job, great job. Uh, Patrick, do you wanna go next? Yeah, no problem. Let me uh, load up the screen here. Lola's got to get out of hers. She's got to leave share screen. That's it. Good. Can you see that there? Perfect. Great. Well, first of all, Charlie, uh, great talk as always, and it's really a pleasure to be able to join you all tonight. Uh, my name is Patrick Codd. I'm a neurosurgeon at Duke, and I would, had the good fortune of being Charlie's fellow in 2016. So you have a, uh, the hip parade tonight. But, um, and so I wanted to just highlight a case that we actually had come here to do last week, uh, end of last week, because I think it highlights and uh, points out some of the issues or concerns that can be raised around keyhole surgery when you're thinking about tumors in certain areas of the brain and actually just to allay those fears a bit. And they've already been talked about a, a bit by Charlie today, but I'll get right into the case here. Um, 71 year old male, he had a number of medical comorbidities, aspirin flavics from some um, carotid disease. He was a former smoker uh, and he had prior colon cancer in resection in 2002. He presented us uh, with multiple episodes of slurred speech that was occurring along with confusion over the previous two days. Uh, once he was put on a little decadron and some Kepra, those completely resolved. When he came to us, he was completely neurologically intact and fluent. He had a chest abdomen pelvis that had a two and a half centimeter left lower lobe nodule. Um, so with that history, this was his MRI. And uh, I'm gonna pause for a minute just before I dive into it, because I think you know, Charlie, where I'm heading with some of this, because some of the concerns that people have brought up with these sort of lesions and dominant hemispheres with language difficulties, what are your thoughts around this? No, exactly that. This is very controversial. It's a good case, Patrick, because some people would insist on doing this awake, given it's open area. Other people would do it through a transylvian, but that needs angled visualization. Other people would map so they could do a transcortical. Uh, other people would use uh, gamma knife or uh, focus radiation because it's just way too dangerous. It's a very controversial case. I mean, my thoughts are that on those views, I'd probably go transylvian. Uh, I would probably end up using the endoscope. Uh, I would do it asleep, not awake. Uh, and I'd warn him that there was a real potential for some post-operative deficit, but you know, there's a good chance that if he did, he would make a pretty good recovery eventually. So, but, but it's a great yeah. case because, you know, look, there's no right way with this one. I think uh, each to their own, but I would do it a sleep Transylvian. That's a, uh, and I really appreciate your thinking around this too. And that's why I wanted to bring it up. This, this gentleman hasn't had a surgery yet. He's being scheduled for next week. So I wanted to bring it up because these are the things that we're thinking about is like, how do we approach this? Um, you know, we've done the tractography. We have, we have obviously the good fortune of being able to apply a number of different modalities to evaluate these preoperative. We have tractography. We have very excellent neuromonitoring capabilities here at Duke. We have, we have teams that can do that if we needed to for awake, for mapping. And I know there were question and answers around how to approach these sort of cases. And I just wanted to highlight this. One of the considerations we've been able to do with cases like this and we're considering here, one was a Transylvian approach like you, you mentioned, Charlie, with the assistance of the endoscope. Um, for, uh, for this, one of the th thinking at least, you know, if you had this lesion anywhere else, we could do this through a burr hole using the keyhole approaches. But however, one of the uh, modifications that we can make around the keyhole approach is maybe a slightly larger access, but that allows cortical exposure that you could actually do this awake with mapping. So we were, can you even do mapping through this hole? You don't need to do a giant temporal craniotomy to expose the entire temporal lobe to map this region. We, I've been able to do, you know, we've been able, had good experience with even four to six lead paddles where you can do negative mapping after di discharge monitoring, awake surgery through very small approaches when really you're just, in, just like in the Keogh principle where you're trying to do a targeted surgical corridor, you can do targeted mapping to really clear an area if you're completely concerned about it. So it essentially can overlap the monitoring experience if your institution has it with the keyhole principle to minimize the associated tissue damage, but still get them a good functional outcome. So I just highlight this case, we're considering doing like a wake mapping with uh, either negative or positive language mapping, but still through something that's going to be about the size of a burr hole. Um, if not, and with the, uh, through a transylvian, if we were to experience, you know, extend our exposure a little superior. But I just wanted to bring that case up to highlight because there's another panelists had brought up some, or the other uh, question and answer session here, had some questions about like, oh, can you do monitoring and all the answers? Yes. And it's really along the same vein of, of, of uh, the uh, keyhole principles. It's just, you have to do what makes the safest and makes the most sense in your hands and with the environment that you're operating in. But Charlie, I wanted to just, I'll, 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 I'll leave it at that. We'll, I'll, I'll keep you posted on how it goes. Uh, but I, I thought it was a good case to, because that's always comes up when we're thinking about keyhole surgery. No, uh, look, it's a great case, Patrick, because it, 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 there's, there's many different ways to approach that. And they're all, re they're all reasonable. Just a shameless plug for Mike Chagru's software. I mean, 
that a swollen edematous gyrus that's uh, superficial to that lesion, it'd be really good to actually see if there's any parcellations represented in that. So mm -hmm. the, the software that he has can not only show you the DTIs and the tracks underneath it, but also the eloquence of the parcellation or the eloquence of the cortex overlying it. So, you know, yeah. it's all about more information, the better. And with some of the technology that's around today, we can get such good information before surgery that, so, well, I hate to say it, but sometimes you just don't even need uh, mapping because you, mm -hmm. you know exactly what you're dealing with preoperatively. Yeah, absolutely no substitute for good surgical technique. Thank, thanks a lot, Charlie. Mm -hmm. Patrick, just to play devil's advocate with you, because I know that, um, you know, obviously you're, you're big into innovation and, and Duke is one of the leading centers for laser. Uh, mm -hmm. What would your thoughts be mm -hmm. on, on laser ablation for a, a small tumor like this in an elephant area? Yeah, it certainly is a consideration. We've uh, tended to lean those more toward the deeper sort of thalamic lesions of this size, um, something that's, or even, you know, uh, you know midbrain pre-peduncular lesions, which are sort of completely encapsulated by white matter tracts. That would be something we would more probably lean toward thinking about for this. I think given our the comfort level that we have, at least as a team with the sort of awake mapping approaches, I think we can get at this pretty pretty safely, or at least as safely as possible, but it's definitely a consideration. I mean, you may see that more and more with uh, more superficial lesions like this. Yeah, no, I, I agree. O open surgery and resection is the best for, for this, unless it was a recurrence or double recurrence, something like that. Okay, uh, great case. Uh, good luck with that. Uh, Simon? Great, thank you very much. Yeah, great. I'm going to share the screen here. Simon, you're the only one who has, you're the only one who has done my fellowship. I know, you barely know me. I mean, this is, uh, I'm an imposter <laughs> here. <laughs> I appreciate being able to crash the party. <laughs> Okay, is that is that appearing okay, Mike? Yeah, it looks good, Sammy. Great. So um, this is a case I think Dr. Teal will probably cringe a little bit because it really doesn't uh, emphasize the the keyhole uh, mantra. But you know, we would very much love his input and uh, the panelists and you as well, Mike, on on this case that I I found to be particularly challenging. So um, this is a case of a 51 year old male otherwise completely normal and developed very sudden onset paresthesias uh, involving the right arm and leg, um, dissipated after a few minutes, and then the next day they returned. Uh, that brought him to an ER uh, where he got a CT and then um, an MRI. And I'll show you guys uh, this MRI here. And I mentioned on this slide that, that you know, though, though being very classic for an insular gliome and a low grade, there are a couple of area of areas of enhancement. So those are the two slices here. There's this kind of anteriorly situated nodule, uh, nodule area of enhancement, and then uh, behind it and a little medial, another area of enhancement. So probably has transformed in those areas to something intermediate or even high grade. Um, this is a video here uh of the of a of, of fine cut flare to give you an extent of the uh, sense of the extent of this so my plan for this and i'll play it again you know was was i think fairly standard was um an awake uh, craniotomy um for uh speech mapping and you know obviously having heard what dr teo had to say to, uh, tonight, I think very interesting to consider, you know, having not done this awake, having done this asleep, but, um, you know, probably at this stage for me, not, not comfortable making that transition yet. Let me show you guys uh, the functional MRI. So we had imported some new software. Oop, hold on, what's that? That I think was giving us some interesting um, results. So let me stop it there. So what this represents here is the arcuate fasciculus and probably more than just that, probably you know, multiple components of the SLF there, running I think fairly well into the lesion there. And I thought I found something fascinating too on this FMR was that you were starting to see some of the supply come from what was fairly robust in terms of the expressive language area here, object and, and uh, object naming here. Kind of feeding into the fibers 
below to the SLF and, and, and to the arcuate. So I knew right out of the gate that there was more functional language representation within this than I think is maybe typical and, and I knew would make for uh, a challenging operation and you know even more so than just the pure extent of this. I think just right out of the gate, just to get Dr. Tio's take or anyone could jump in here too, but what are your thoughts when you're seeing that kind of functional imaging preoperatively? If you see that kind of relationship to the SLF, you know, are you already real thinking that you're being, you know, your resection, your extent is going to be limited? Or how is that impacting your decision, really awake versus asleep now, based on what we heard tonight, but also, um, you know, on, a, on, on just a fundamental level, whether or not you think you can go transopercular, would you, uh, approach this transylvian uh, or through the superior temporal gyrus, how much of that would be dependent on your mapping. Um, just wanted to kind of solicit some thoughts on, on some of that right out of the, before I got to what I did here. So again, thank you, Simon, a great case. It really does make you think about uh, the different options available to you. But uh, look, I could talk about this for hours. So if you don't mind, I might just distill my information into a few sentences. The first thing is that there is no doubt that my technique of awake surgery has a higher complication rate. So as you know, the literature would suggest that Mitch Berger and Dufoe have a permanent neurological deficit rate of about 3%. Well, in my hands, you're looking at 6 to 9%. So it's two or three times higher. So I'm not saying that you can get away with it, but I will say this much, that my total GTR rates are much higher. Mm -hmm. So from an oncological viewpoint, I think there's a real advantage in doing them asleep. From a quality of life point of view, there's clearly a price that you might have to pay. And that's what I would say to the patient. I'd say, listen, I'd like to do this asleep. I think I can get a better resection. Uh, I think your speech is gonna be clearly at risk because of the preoperative tests that we've done. Uh, but in my hands, that risk of permanent speech deficit is less than 10%. Temporary speech deficit is greater than 50%. Uh, but I think the oncological uh, advantage that we can get from that is worth it. Uh, in other words, you know, more resection, the longer you're going to live. If they say, listen, you know, quality is much more important than quantity. Uh, if I had a speech deficit, permanent speech deficit, I just wouldn't want to live. And of course, I'm going to say we should do it awake. If they say, yep, you know, I've got grandchildren I want to see live, I've got something to live for, I, you know, uh, I think uh, a speech deficit is something I, that would not detract from my quality of life, then let's go for it. Uh, but no, no, you're absolutely right. It's, there's many different ways to skin a cat and a lot of it has got to do with their pre, your preoperative consent and being very honest with them about your audit and your results, not the literature's results. And so I tell them, if you want it done awake, then I'm not the best person. I'll refer, refer you to Mike Chagru. Uh, if you're willing to accept a deficit, which is two to three times higher than if Mike does it uh, for an oncological advantage, then I'm willing to do it for you. Right. Yeah, and I think that that's a, a great way of putting it. I mean, this is the fine line we walk in this world, right? I mean, the trade-off between, you know, overall survival versus quality of life, it's very hard line you know it's very hard compromise to make and i think you're right I think you, you know you really kind of gauge where the patient and their family is at i mean this is a completely normal person he just had intermittent paresthesias that resolved and he's a normal guy so um you know they were very emphatic at that stage about um taking on some potential morbidity for long-term survival at 51 with a couple of uh, young kids in their late teens um, and with good support in place, you know, in the event that he did have a deficit, very dedicated wife, very, uh, uh, at least one kid living at home to kind of get him through some of that acute recovery, which I also factored in. Um, so anyway, you know, we went ahead um, with, a, with what will appear a little bit gross here, given how fine every incision and opening has been. Um, this was... It, just of note too, he's bilingual, English second language, totally fluent, Portuguese first language. Um, this is just a, a view here of, of some of the mapping that we did of the uh, inferior frontal operculum and the superior temporal gyrus. And I found the case to be frustrating in that every single gyrus there that I uh, stimulated 
um, correlated to a paraphasic error or outright speech arrest. Every single gyre is there. Yes. So for me who, you know, you know, the skill set may be a little bit limited and I kind of was hoping for maybe a transopercular corridor for something this big that was just totally closed off to me in this case. And I, I found that to be frust frustrating at an early stage. In fact, some of the superior temporal gyrus itself, a little bit posterior, probably due to IFOF or what have you, you know, also led to some paraphasic errors or not as profound. But ultimately, I didn't really do anything truly transylvian here. I just basically poked through the, the superior temporal gyrus and cored it out here. This resolution didn't come through well, but, um, and it cleared some out. And then I'm basically just clearing out very little bit of tumor. It's more ma mainly normal brain there that you can see. And then you're just starting to look at the undersurface uh, of the fissure. Yeah. And that's basically how I started, you know, kind of uncapping the, the, the insula in this case. I don't have much, uh, you know, high quality footage of, of the actual surgery uh, beyond this. Um, his exam was not robust throughout the case. And, you know, looking back on this, have this is now six months out. I have a little bit of remorse because he hasn't done well, done great, and I'll get to that. But I did kind of push through because some of the paraphasic errors had worsened at a fairly early stage in the surgery, not at that stage, but when we actually were in the insula. Um, but I pushed and I felt like I got a, a good oncologic, you know, a good resection here. And here's the, the post T2. Um, we cleared out the temporal lobe. You see the skeletonized uh, uh, M2s as well. But obviously, you have this component here. And this is um, the reason I'm bringing the contrast here is because of the preoperative enhancement that was there, which you see isn't there. So it looks like it really kind of contracted and, and I got to that. And it ultimately was graded as an anaplastic because of those areas, even though overwhelmingly yeah. it was a grade yeah. two. Um, and this is uh, now three months. I'm, we're six months from this, but this is three months, ago, oh, sorry, three months ago. And this is the T2. And it's contracted a little bit, but you see there's obviously still some stuff anterior and there's probably a little bit more of the corona radiata that's wasted there, um, you know, from probably just very small perforator injury. He um, was weak, very weak in his arm. He had some, a little bit of strength. Leg was better. His English really took a hit. The Portuguese, not so much. At three months, he was able to get around with a cane. The arm would come back a little bit. The language was definitely improving from a receptive component. Um, and this was a grade three. And I think the, some of the, the questions that I just had personally here were, I mean, some things we already just touched upon were, you know, how much, you know, in a, in a way, this kind of evolved into almost an asleep operation because as he got worse, I just said, you know what, I don't think I've gotten enough of this tumor out. And I, I made the decision to push it a lot, a lot of it due to the preoperative, uh, you know, counsel that and, and discussion that we had. Um, so I did push it and probably went further because I almost behaved as this was as if he was asleep. I didn't wake him up so much during the resection, which is kind of a no no. But the exam became less reliable, and I pushed it. And he has these deficits, and his level, you know, whether or not he's going to be able to return to work is an open question. Um, but yeah, I mean, these are just some of the thoughts that I had in kind of pursuing a case like this. And even with all that, there's still a little bit of this anterior. One one other thing I'll point out is. You know, this was a case where I was really lift, you know, physically kind of lifting up the operculum and reaching under to come around on top and in front of this glioma. It was very difficult. I think the endoscope would have been great there, and I, and I really regret not incorporating it because the angles, the visualization was just so cut off because of that just half of brain that I had to kind of work underneath. But even with preserving that, he still had these, you know, he still had these uh, post-operative issues. So figured I'd share this and see kind of what, what people thought, and what you thought, Dr. Teal, as well. Well, Simon, I wouldn't self-flagellate too much over this case. <laughs> I mean, it's difficult. You had, okay, so if you look at the literature on insular gliomas, it talks about the increased morbidity with extension belong beyond the limiting sulci. Mm -hmm. And so you had extension inferiorly through the temporal stem into the temporal lobe. You had extension anteriorly through the limiting sulci into the frontal lobe. 
you had a little bit of superior extension as well. Uh, and you probably had a little bit of medial extension as well. So in a dominant hemisphere, I mean, God, you know, you, it's a difficult case in anyone's hands. Uh, so first of all, don't be too hard on yourself. Secondly, I'm not quite sure how you got the hemiparesis because your resection looked good. It certainly didn't look like it was too extensive. So I only presume that it must have been an LSA or a perforator or maybe retraction of the MCA trunk or something, but it didn't look like you went into the capsule at all. No, so, I don't think it was capsular. I think it might have been more corona radiata because it looked a little attenuated. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I was just about I to say right. that. I think it's LSA yep. or some periphery. Yeah. Again, the literature supports that. I didn't think that when I first started intial gliomas, but the literature says with superior extension, that's when you get into the corona radiata yeah. and that's when you get those problems. So, uh, and without like, sounding like a smart ass, I must say that uh, every time you mention that with, when you touch those Gyri, you got speech problems, cement, cement, uh, paraphasic speech problems. I was looking at that scan pre-op and thinking, gee, you're going to get speech problems with all of those things, except yeah. for the anterior temporal tip. Mm -hmm. And I would have done right. a that very was the only place that, yeah. Yeah, was, um, yep, I would have done that. I would have done a temporal lobectomy, five centimeters max. I wouldn't have gone any further back than that. That would have really exposed your uh, insula. You would have seen your LSAs really early and the MCA trunk. Uh, and then I must say that I probably would have carried that anteriorly into the frontal lobe as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, your resection's good. I mean, it's, it's not bad. It's uh, just not as good as I would have done. Gotcha. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's why you're there. That's why I'm here. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just kidding, Simon. No, I'm just no. kidding. <laughs> Uh, that does bring up a couple questions that people had uh, for you is anything you do to kind of um, protect the LSAs, like intraoperative use of repavirin, postoperative hypertension, anything to kind of prevent either spasm or stroke um, uh, in these difficult insular cases? I would have said no initially, but having spent some time with Alan Friedman at Duke, who's a brilliant surgeon, as you know, who's done a lot of insular gliomas. I did an insular glioma there at Duke and the patient was a little bit hemiparetic afterwards and I didn't know what was going on. Alan goes, listen, it's, it's all spasm from your LSAs, uh, hypertensin. So we did, we gave him some inotrope and he improved immediately. Hmm. And uh, so I think that's, uh, that's something that I'm more cognizant of these days, that if they have a post op deficit, it may not be just swelling and it may not be the LSVs, it may actually be a bit of spasm of the LSAs. And if you, if you give them a trial of uh, inotrope and they improve, then you, you've basically clinched your diagnosis. Okay. Um, Rick's, Rick's still stuck in the OR, but he did want me to present it in the last one minute that we have here. So, and it is a short case. Uh, so, so, um, so this is kind of a, a 45 year old uh, female with uh, worsening language difficulties, uh, non enhancing lesion in the left frontal lobe. Um, and here's the kind of the showing not very, very well kind of delineated as, as Dr. Tio was kind of talking about in some of his tumors. But obviously, it comes to the surface here where, where you were talking about, you know, keyhole surgery, the idea of maximizing the depth and, and exposure. And so, uh, you know, he was just interested in, in, in these kind of larger cases when you're talking about lobectomies, you know, do you take the same approach? Um, I think with gliomas, obviously you have a little bit more wiggle room than if this was a meningioma, but approach incision, um, you know, and then do you do it awake uh, for, for positive or just negative mapping or would you just do it asleep uh, in, in general? Okay, I can cut straight to this. So yeah. to me, it looks like an oligodendroglioma. It's so well demarcated. It doesn't have any enhancement. It's right frontal, left frontal. It comes to the surface. So I have a very clear approach here. So no mapping asleep. Why? Because essentially there's no normal brain that you have to cut through and it's well demarcated. So you can do an anatomical resection and you wouldn't be doing a super resection in this area anyway, because she's already got a speech problem, which means that you're very, very sailing close to the breeze anyway. So sleep, well demarcated, comes to the surface, don't have to cut through a normal brain. The incision, I'd make a hairline incision and it's not exposing the entire surface of the tumor, but what it does is it exposes enough where you can debulk it, it shrinks down. As you know, the whole brain shrinks down, you get access to it, you can look at it. Uh, and uh, it's what Mike Chagru in my book calls cheating. 
So, you know, you're actually cheating a little bit. You're not exposing the whole surface, but you know that it's going to collapse once you take out some of it and you can get, you can get to the rest of it. So hairline incision, craniotomy that goes quite low, uh, tries to expose all of it, but not, you won't get all of it without doing a massive incision. Uh, go through the tumor, identify the uh, borders, don't do a super resection. Hopefully it's going to be an oligo, grade two, uh, and, uh, and you'll and get a great oligo. And, and, and roofing the uh, ventricle in these cases? Um, if it yeah, don't even worry about that. Yeah. I, I think someone has shown that. I, th I think I read a paper once saying, does morbidity increase if you open the ventricle? And the answer was no. And I think, I think my uh, experience has been that as well. That, uh, that, yeah, if you have to open the ventricle, open it. Don't. don't leave tumor behind because you're fearful of opening the ventricle. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think we did very similar to you. I mean, in this case, uh, we tend to do a lot of our cases awake, uh, just because we feel that practice with anesthesia makes the complication rate excessively lower, but everything else you said, we basically did very minimal mapping that was needed in this anatomical resection. The incision was just like you said, very small, just behind the hairline, just because everything kind of fell back. And we've been trying to do that with any frontal or temporal lobectomy now, uh, same kind of principle that even if it does come to the surface and it's a wide surface area, the idea that things fall into you and with gliomas, you're going to make that space uh, tends to go. So not, not as small as your keyholes, but, uh, but in Florida, that's, that's a keyhole surgery. <laughs> okay. That's a, that's a great result. What, what was the pathology? Uh, the pathology was a legal glioma. You're right. Yeah, exactly. Okay, well, that's, uh, that's more than enough time. We thank Dr. Tio again uh, so much for um, his time. Uh, hopefully you have a good day. The rest of us have a good evening. Thank you to the panelists and everybody stay safe and, and we'll see you here next week. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. Thanks.